Mandela Day will not be a holiday, but a day devoted to service. Nelson Mandela means a whole lot to people. Selflessness. It's about time we rise up. Nelson Mandela Day, I'm working with an NGO from my community. So on Nelson Mandela Day, I'll be at the soup kitchen where I work. Go help in a home shelter. That'd be nice. It is our hope that people will dedicate their time and effort to improve the conditions within their own community. Madiba started the change. Now it's time to play your part. Take action. Inspire change. Make every day a Mandela Day. Hijacked. (laughs) (laughs) Ever since I left, I worked with Oliver Tambo. Oliver Tambo had a stroke, and the decision was, that Mandela was now deputy president of the ANC after he was released. Effectively, mm-hmm. the internal machinery, Mandela now chaired the National Executive Committee. He wanted his office to be set up. He'd asked Barbara Masekela, uh, Jesse Duarte, and because they assumed I knew something about how that work <laughs> happened, asked me. I was head of research, but I wanted to come home anyway. So then the three of us became sort of secretariat. I believe Mr. Mandela specifically wanted you in the post of Speaker of Parliament. Why do you think he wanted you in that position? I don't know. We had met and had decided what kind of parliament we wanted. Of course, we wanted a woman in the senior position. We'd already put forward the number of women MPs we wanted. I wanted to go in and relax, if you please. (laughs) Not a chance. Write the things I'd wanted to be writing, wanted to do the thinking that needed to be thinking, and which I hadn't got around to doing. And none of that won any points as far as he was concerned. His attitude was... Every time I ask you and Kathy to do something, you say no. <laughs> so basically he bullied you or steamrolled you into that post? Oh, your word. <laughs> How would you describe Mr. Mandela's role or relationship with Parliament, the institution? He had such an immense respect for Parliament when he was voted in. And then he had to resign. He was upset. <laughs> he said, must I resign? And they said, yes, because you're going to be the president. So he didn't want to leave. He felt he had to give it support. He used to come there regularly, sit on his desk. It was a chance to meet other people, but importantly to hear debates. He didn't need to because the rules provided for him to speak. But he would send me a note saying, Speaker, may I speak on this issue, please? So he would show tremendous respect for Parliament. He also, for example, when ministers didn't pitch or didn't do their homework, and if I mentioned it, there would be trouble. You see, he believed that we had to get Parliament right because it would be the first visible signs of change. And this is what he was very specific to me. Please make sure that you run the parliament the way we ran the negotiations, inclusively, and accommodating people. So now when I sat there, I said, how the hell do I do that? (laughs) Because parliament was a kind of horseshoe. And, you know, its tradition was the government on the right, the speaker of the opposition on the left. And we had over a 66% majority. So I spoke to the ANC whips. And I said, look, you please give me some front benches and move the others to the back. Mm -hmm. And they understood the politics of it. This is why when you switched on TV, people would see de Klerk, they would see Mongosuto, and then they would see the general in the front row. So for everybody who saw those pictures, they said, there's our leader, there's our parliament. How would you describe him as a person? Politically, a person who is prepared to listen. Politically, a person who'd done an incredible amount of reading while he was in prison and understood South Africa. Someone who was also overwhelmed by the notion that he could never break up South Africa, that we had to keep it together, whatever the cost. 
he also had a kind of Gandhian belief that if what you were doing was right, the right thing would happen. He would push for negotiations inclusiveness. But there was a point where he would not go beyond. Right at the end of Kudessa, when he had agreed to let Mr. de Klerk speak last, and when the rest of us heard it, we were furious because we didn't believe in good intentions. And uh, when de Klerk sat down and, you know, his speech was outrageous, attacking the bona fides of the ANC, we were all furious. Somebody had to reply. So Madiba didn't ask anybody. He just got up and walked to the podium. And at that stage, in that atmosphere, no one, not even the Chief Justice, could have stopped him. And he tore strips off de Klerk. And I thought de Klerk was going to be apoplectic because he had his head in his hands and it got redder and redder and redder. But Matiba just accused him of bad faith, not only then, but also right through the talks, etc., etc. But it turned the country around. In a nutshell, how would you describe Madiba's legacy? Well, if I can put it in something he taught me. One day he said, you're trying to solve that problem, but is it the problem the other side wants to solve? And I was quiet, and I had to think it through. I realized his way of work, his way of thinking was, first to identify a problem, make sure it is the same problem that is bugging the other party, then you can solve it. So I see his legacy to force us to look at the problem and identify the problem as both sides see it. Is there like an all-time favorite Madiba moment that just stands out for you or that you'll always treasure? He used to go for a walk with his security behind him. They could never keep up with him because he was very, very, very fit. Suddenly the phone started ringing around seven. Franny, have you seen Madiba? I said, no. Why? His security can't find him. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy it. <laughs> they lost him. <laughs> And it seemed he had been walking, and then he saw a taxi, and he jumped into it. <laughs> didn't have any money. But they were quite happy to bring him to the Tuli house. And uh, he called somebody down to pay the taxi, though they wouldn't want the money. And he went to his office and sat down. And when Barbara finally said, listen, I better go to the office and see if we can't find him, she virtually screamed because there he was drinking coffee. <laughs> And he had everyone scurrying around looking for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those early days were panicky. Those